All right, welcome to uh, lecture number, I don't know, uh, five maybe. Last time we started looking at the supersymmetry equations applied to a vacuum with the uh, neural Schwartz tree form. And we arrived to the, to the system of six equations. Um, you might not particularly like them, but uh, now we are going to try and make them more geometrical in nature. We start from this uh, middle row. Actually, so before we, uh, we even start from this middle row, then I could deal with them in general, but uh, you, you can immediately notice that the one column has only eta one, and another column has only eta two. So there are two systems which are completely coupled from each other. So we could just analyze the system on eta one separate from the system uh, for eta two. They are decoupled as far, so to, to be clear, um, the etas are decoupled. Of course, the, they are coupled by the fact that the geometry, the underlying geometry and the underlying age are the same. But actually, this creates an opportunity. This observation that the etas are uh, decoupled creates an opportunity because you see, um, n equal to supersymmetry is great for many reasons, it makes uh, things calculable. But in uh, the real world, we know that uh, supersymmetry is not realized um, as in the sense that it's spontaneously broken at least, uh, I mean, at best. So um, we shouldn't expect it to be um, realized in the vacuum. And if we can reduce the amount of supersymmetry, then perhaps we are gaining something, uh, getting closer to a realistic vacuum. So in that spirit, it would be good to have n equal one vacuum instead of n equal two. Now for Calabi house, this was not possible. With this answer, and especially given that we uh, took eta one into equal to eta two, once you uh, solve once you find that the, um, that you have a covariant constant spin on, then automatically so the, okay the, the, forget the answers for a second. Let's say that you have a Calabrian, you know that there is a covariant constant spin on. Well, then it's automatically uh, in equal to because I can take eta one and eta two equal to that particular eta. And this zeta are completely independent. However, so that, then it's uh, automatically n equal to. It's not up to you to choose it. This is the super algebra. However, suppose we solve the uh, the system in the first column. Then you might say, okay, I'll take, uh, my, so I have found the eta one that satisfies this, uh, this system for a given geometry H and phi. Well, then you might say, okay, I'll do the same as for Calabria, I'll take eta one and uh, equal to eta two. And surely this is going to be n equal to again. Well, no, because the system so if you take eta one equal to eta two, then you see that the, the fact that you have solved this first column doesn't imply at all that you have solved the second column. Because it's a different system of equations. If you have solved this, uh, the first column with a given h, you see that h here appears with, a, with the opposite sign. But the physical fields are fixed. You cannot just change them while you go. So if you solve the system, 
you have achieved n equal one, not n equal two. Because you cannot just take eta two eta equal to eta one and then have this zeta three. So if you solve this system, we don't also solve this. Eta two equal to eta one. There might be another solution, eta two, that solves this. And then in that case, you realize n equal two. But you have now the opportunity of realizing n equal one back. If you just take eta two equals zero. In that case, the, the this second row becomes zero identically, and your answer becomes your spinorial uh, parameters become just this. So and then the single Eta one, we just call it theta. This is a valid uh, set of uh, supersymmetry parameters. So you see that there is only a single uh, zeta plus to complex parameters, so four superchargers. And it's n equal one as promised. Okay, so then let's solve, uh, for now, let's solve the only the first column. With theta, and theta one, we just call it theta for now. I, I didn't hear you. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Okay, I, I'll write in the chat. I still cannot hear you well, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps you can write it in the chat. Um, let's see, chat. Um, so you wrote that the mic doesn't work, but uh, is it mic? Oh, no. You can hear me, right? Good. So please go ahead and ask your question. Killing spinos, do they select supersymmetry? So the zetas are killing spinos. So uh, perhaps I didn't, uh, this deserves a comment. In fact, so I, I understand what you. So yesterday I said I'll take this killing spinos. Now for Minkowski, how many of these there are? Okay. So for Minkowski, Uh, these are just constant. Kini spinos can be taken to be constant. For ADS, um, 
there is a more complicated formula. Okay, well, maybe I'll write at some point and let me know right now. But uh, there are still, so there's the same number for Achilles Spino. So these are determined by uh, some constant spinos. So there's a certain formula in terms of constant spinos. So the moral of the story is that there are four of them. So this is a first order, do you can view it in another way? This is a first order equation. So its uh, solutions are determined by the values at one point. No, not by the value of one point and its uh, derivatives is for a second order equation. So there are just uh, four of them, four real independent ones, both in Minkowski and ADS. And in the seat, uh, they don't exist. Well, not in this form. There is a generalization which would work, uh, but um, uh, it doesn't quite work for for compatifications and um, so that I'll, I'll take the opportunity to reveal to you the fact that you probably already know that for the sitter we cannot realize this image. So um, good question since I didn't say this you could uh, you could even imagine you could imagine that uh, perhaps kin uh, there were only two kin spinos and that would um, not deserve uh, being called an, an equal one vacuum vacuum solution. And uh, but uh, no, the, there are, uh, so the number, we can just continue counting the supercharges as if they were constant, basically, both in Minkowski and ADS. Um, ah, okay. okay. I was going to ask you if I had answered the question. Thank you, and sorry for that. I could sort of hear something, but... Um, yeah, the mic was not ideal. All right, so um, let's look at the second equation here. Now here we could be, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to drop the slash. From now on, so I'm tired of writing it. Unless it creates confusion. So when I feel it might, it might create confusion, if you ask me to reinstate it, I'll do it. I'll do it. But otherwise, I'll uh, freely confuse forms with the corresponding um, gammas, with the corresponding bispinos. So instead of writing the A slash as I wrote here, I just write this. So, but explicitly what this means is this, right? And now we observe that, um, we observe that I made a mistake. <laughs> One of these is wrong, sorry. Uh, I just copied. This was a minus. Of course, it couldn't be because the a single the action of a single gamma changes chirality, and so we know that the chirality of this guy is plus, and so it should match with the chirality on the left-hand side. So now it's correct. Before it couldn't be correct. I mean, it would have implied immediately that both the right-hand side and the left-hand side uh, are zero. Actually, it, does, it still does so, but let's, uh, we have to work a little hard to realize it. So, um, well, like, I can do this in a slightly more abstract way and, uh, and then in, more concrete way. So the abstract way is that for any 
um, we saw the Foreni Spino, it's a plus. There's a basis. of um, chirality of spinos with chirality plus. It's made of uh, gamma plus itself and gamma i bar into minus Well, we saw the gamma i bar, the uh, lower i bar. Ah, sorry. This gamma. To be careful by my conventions. So the, sorry. The, my conventions, gamma i bar eta plus is zero, lower i bar. So, um, gamma upper i bar, so gamma lower i eta plus is different from zero. Upper i bar eta plus is different from zero, and then conjugating, we find that this is non zero. So remember, so the more concrete model, the more concrete point of view is that we saw that um, any spinner in six dimensions can be rotated to this model plus 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 and then these guys are the creator so got a gamma upper one acting on eta minus which is me minus 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 sorry two creators Uh, what am I saying? One case. <laughs> and um, uh, two minus and one plus. And then similar three, the diagram identity acting on eta minus, which is. proportional to minus plus minus and finally sigma three sigma three creator which is minus minus plus so this is a concrete version of this statement so in a way, you see that um, now these, since some of the, the gamma i bar eta minus would be zero, and instead of having kratos, it contains um, annihilators acting on minus minus minus. So then this can be written like this. And of the one here because we chose to call it eta without any label. And now we see that since this and these are um, belong to a basis, then they their coefficients should independently vanish. But then by complex conjugation, since A is real, this also implies by complex conjugation that the lie bar A equals zero. So A is constant, in fact, equals zero. 
a is constant. Incidentally, before I go on with the analysis, um, I want to point something out. So the I repeated many times that the eta, the data of eta plus can be reformulated in terms of uh, data of j and omega. And then we also saw that omega determines an object called the almost complete structure, which in favor of all conditions uh, is, uh, can be called also a complex structure. Well, here I was a little too hasty in using, I've done it for my convenience, let's say, I, um, in using this complex um, index, because I don't know yet if, the, if this is a complex structure. The analysis should have been done a little more carefully, but the result is exactly the same. So, uh, I shouldn't have really have used this uh, complex uh, complex uh, index, I should have used a holomorphic projector uh, based on this i. This pi. And this is one remark. The other remark is that the, uh, while we saw that eta plus defines omega and which defines i, well, i can be defined even more quickly by uh, looking at eta plus itself in the sense that the the one zero forms or one zero vectors associated to y can be determined exactly by this equation directly from um, so this is the one which is zero uh, no right it's correct from, from this equation so these two equations tell me what index I should call. Uh, well, so they help me define the almost complex structure directly. So with this equation, this equation, I can define eta directly, um, uh, i directly from eta plus. So you can think that the one zero forms are those that uh, um, annihilate minus, say. Okay, end of comment. And we get back to the analysis. So if A is constant, it turns out that I can just, uh, the, that constant is in complete immaterial because it multiplies the, so mu equals zero means that, uh, what? M means that we are in Minkowski, in fact. As I said here, the from Minkowski, the zetas are just constant. I mean, the way to solve this equation for me, a way to solve this equation for Minkowski is just to take them constant. Indeed, you see, if I put the zeta equal constant here, I get mu equals zero. Uh, there is a there is a um, uh, interesting exercise you can you can make. We saw that uh, for that uh, on a Calabiao covalently constant spinor implies the um, uh, that the space is richly flat. For uh, the same computation that uh, the, uh, that we did there, if you repeat it with this equation, you'll find that the cosmological constant. is minus three mu square, modulus of mu square, absolute value. Uh, by the way, here mu can be taken to be complex, which is why I have put this um, absolute value. Uh, but in fact, I'll, I'll take it to be real. Nothing, uh, it turns out that nothing is gained really by taking it uh, to be complex. This is an exercise, and once again, it's uh, 
uh, done the same way we showed that the uh, that the covariant to constant spin off on a Calabiao uh, implies that the Calabiao is a true flat. So uh, a covariant constant spin in six Euclidean dimensions implies that the space is a uh, flat, and that space is called the Calabiao. So uh, this is in agreement with what I said uh, before. I was saying it more simply because uh, constant, uh, if I plug a constant here, I have mu equals zero. So lambda equals zero. But then if I have Minkowski, then I think about it, this is e to the well, how did this appear in the metric? I had e to the 2a. This was the line element in 10 dimensions. But now this is content. I can, I can well, since this is Minkowski, I can just rescale the coordinates of uh, the Minkowski space and uh, reabsorb a knot. So equal, equal zero without loss of generality. Okay, so the uh, this is what I anticipated that uh, we st we started out a little more general, uh, but we landed in uh, Minkowski with zero warping. So a little bit of this, it smells a bit of a failure, but uh, well, we'll in more complicated cases we won't fail. So now we have uh, some other equations here and um, copy them. And what we start. One is algebraic, one is differential. Let's start with the, uh, the hardest looking one. So here, this will serve, me, uh, serve to illustrate a general method. Actually, I'll do this only once, but I... Um, I'll refer to the to this result several times. I refer to this type of computation several times. We mentioned the similar computation when I was talking about the uh, the intrinsic torsion coefficients. So remember that the with this J and omega here are bilinear of the spin off. So I can try to reformulate this equation, which tells me something about the derivative of eta into an equation for J. Now, J is a form, it smells more geometrical. Let's see what happens. So, first of all, there's some kind of Leibniz identity, which I uh, quickly mentioned at some point.
I leave this as an exercise. So I think it is a good exercise. Mm. You, require to, you, you know all the elements, basically. You need to use the uh, definition of spinorial uh, derivative. And you need to be a little subtle about what you're providing to differentiating. Uh, It's a bit lengthy. If you don't like, if you find it a uh, little too long, perhaps you can do this similar exercise with uh, uh, where you have a bilinear with one gamma and two different spinos instead of uh, them being equal. Just because uh, you should take them to be different because otherwise the, um, the bilinear of a single light up will, will be zero. But anyway, this is conceptually the, the same. The reason it's an exercise and it's not uh, a priori completely obvious is that you might wonder why there is no covariant derivative of the gammas here. After all, the gammas are not constant at all. They are defined in terms of a field bind. And even if I were constant, well, they, uh, here there's a current, uh, there's uh, some connection in the definition of current. Uh, so there's some gamma in the definition of current derivative. So why should it even matter if they were constant? There would be the other, the second term in the current derivative with the gamma. And so, well, it must be that they somehow combine to, to make this formula true. It all works out, but it's a, um, it's a nice exercise. You might get confused at some point. So now I can use this. So if I dagger this equation, What do I find? Uh, so dm of eta is one fourth hm eta. And now, well, of course, the dagger, the, pod, uh, the dagger product is the product of the daggers in the opposite. Ex um, Order, but HM dagger, well, HM is HM and P, gamma and P. Now, gamma and P dagger is gamma PN, which is minus gamma and P. So, in this case, it's a minus sign. In fact, also this will be a sandwich of eta plus da uh, dagger and eta plus. So, yeah. All right, then together here. Now, I need to remember what these are. And I see that I reconstruct here.
Pamiętajcie. This comitato is the same we encounter. Well, oh, sorry, there's one over eight here. It's the HM is, in fact, one half. HM, QR, gamma QR. Now here, uh, this comitato is the same that we um, in spirit encountered long ago. I mean, this close, the committed to two gammas with two indices should uh, be a, a linear combination of two such gammas again, because the this is uh, supposed to be a representation of after all of the Lorentz group. This is the concrete computation. It can also be computed with the formula um, that we gave for gamma m acting from the left. And from the right, so. So this operator gave minus to the degree of the form in which we were acting. So from these two, you could also obtain this, this equality. Anyway, I won't insist on you making uh, doing this exercise because the, um, it's a lot easier to, in this case, it's uh, easier to obtain this from the Clifford algebra. So, now, we see that the gammas, these two gammas inside this two eta plus reconstruct a J again. And what we get is this. You see that this is like a, um, we contract Let me first try to let this and then I'll make a correction. I first write something. Um, correct, but uh, slightly improper. So the, the reason I wrote this is that I have here inside this sandwich, I have eta plus to gammas eta. And this is J again. The reason I don't quite like it is that I never wrote before J with one index up and one index down. And you might say, oh, okay, what's the problem? You, we have been raising uh, the index of, uh, with the metric for, for a long time. Uh, right, however, the Remember also that the metric is related to the complex structure or the almost complex structure and the and the two form. I wrote it like this now. I mean, the, in a previous um, version, I wrote it to J equal I times J, uh, G equal I times J. Now I put the I on the other side by using, um, by using that it's um, the squares to minus one. 
And from this, it follows that if when I raise the index of J, I get I. Write that explicitly. So this guy, I could have called it J with one index up, one, one index up, uh, down. And that's why some people do that, but I prefer reserving a different name to it because they, um, this has really a different role. It's uh, the almost complex structure. So I like it better if we call this I. So this structure looks a bit like a mess, but um, what this is is just I acting in the, so since I has an index, one index up and one down, um, what is it? Uh, what is its uh, natural action? Well, the index up should uh, act by contraction and the index down by, uh, by wedge. And this is exactly what happens. You, one index is contracted and the other one is wedged in the sense that the, the two are anti-symmetrized. Okay. So we have this uh, semi-nice equation on the, on the current de derivative of J. Uh, this could, could be promoted to to a more general computation. So, for example, now we could imagine. Uh, let's do the same computation on this. So after all, we also know uh, the formula for omega uh, with a bilinear. But now I, I want to make this uh, observation here of the contraction on, of the wedge um, a little more explicit. Now, this will be a, some, a sort of parenthesis. We won't um, really, really need it, but it, it, it's an um, anticipation for later computations. So instead of doing it, doing this in the same way, I want to introduce a different version of the same computation here. Instead of doing a computation uh, derivative of the bilinear, I think it's time to introduce something called the Fierce identity. What is this? So we saw that these guys, at some point I mentioned that these guys are by spinos. Eta plus, of course, is a spino, but I can build from it also so why are these by spinors first of all? Because they have two spinorial indices, of course. And it has one. Now, how can I make a by spinner from a spinner? Well, I can take, uh, how can I obtain a, a, another the two indices out of another two, one index? Well, I can take a product. It would be 
a tensor product. Uh, I write it like this with a, um, with a dagger. I could equally well consider here the transposition. But I prefer the dagger for now. This is also by Spino. It has two spinoral indices. It's a bit like when you have, so you can think of it as a projector in this, on the space of Spinos. This acts, of course, on the space of Spinos. Uh, and this also acts on the space of Spinos. Because, for example, if it acts on a eta, what does it give? Is this or more generally, this could be another spino. It's a bit like in quantum mechanics when you associate to a to a, a state. This operator. This is, of course, a fine operator that we use many times in quantum mechanics, which is the projector on the space of uh, states of this type. Because when you, uh, this can act on any other state, say time, by giving what? The state psi times this. And what I did here is exactly the same. Okay, so it's an operator on the space of Spinos and other words a, a sp uh, by Spino. And so I can expand it on a basis of by Spinos. It turns out that these guys, if I consider all the possible uh, indices, including zero indices, like also the identity and so on, all the way to the gamma with the D anti-symmetrized indices, which in fact is proportional to, uh, well, uh, the only possibility is the gamma, the current gamma, the product of all the gammas. This guy, this thing is a basis of base beams. You should be familiar, I think, with this in four dimensions where we use it many times um, in quantum field theory. When we try to list operators, for example, that, that we can put in a permanent Lagrangian, we need to list all the possibilities, all the possible objects that you build out of, uh, of uh, gammas. And we find that you can only have gamma, gamma mu, gamma mu nu, and then there, there will be gamma mu rho according to my statement here. The next would be like this, but gamma mu rho, the part of the three gammas in four dimensions can be rewritten in terms of uh, the carrel gamma times uh, uh, a single gamma. So this is how we use it in uh, quantum field theory. But it's the same statement. So since it's a basis, you can write it as a sum of coefficients on this basis. So it will be one plus some coefficients times gamma m. We give a name to the coefficients. Cm plus, I want to put the one over two here, Cmn gamma mn and so on. How do we find these coefficients? As usual, by projection. So if you have a vector V and you want to write it as a, in terms of some basis here, how do you find Vm? Well, you just project on the basis 
if it's an orthonormal basis, uh, you take an inner product and then you discover that this is just Vm. But you can do the same here. The gamma m, gamma m n, and so on are sort of an um, orthonormal basis with respect to an inner product. What's the inner product on a space of matrices? It's uh, the trace. So the, the in the space of real matrices, um, the inner product of two, uh, the natural inner product, Euclidean inner product of uh, two matrices A and B is trace A transpose B. So if I have So the same uh, can be done with by spin. So I just take the product, I uh, maybe transpose or dagger if they are complex, one of them, and then I um, and then I take the trace. Here I can do the same, and with respect to these, uh, to this in a product, this is an orthonormal basis. Indeed. For example, one of these is orthogonal to these because gamma trace of gamma m, gamma np is zero. The gammas with the d indices are, with respect to this product are not uh, not orthogonal only to the gammas with the same number of indices. In fact, we can compute this in general. This is zero if k equals l, different from l. And otherwise, you get a bunch of deltas. You get the dimensional space of spinos, which is this. times uh, deltas galore. Anti-symmetrized. So using this fact that the basis is orthonormal, you can determine these by taking the trace, by multiplying this by a gamma with uh, uh, any number of indices you like, and then taking the trace. So for example, the coefficient in front of one here, I should have called it C naught, will be obtained by taking the trace and doing nothing else. So taking the trace on the left, what do you get? What is the trace of uh, eta plus and so eta plus dagger. But just like in quantum mechanics, what is the trace of this operator? It is just psi psi. You can think of it this way. This is a, a trace is cyclic. So you can put this in front. So it's a norm. And so on. Next, you're going to 
and determine this coefficient by multiplying by gamma n, say on the right, and taking the trace. And now taking the trace, you'll get eta plus dagger gamma n, um, eta plus on the left hand side. And so you determine the CM as the, this bilinear. When all is said and done, the formula looks like this. I'll put here also a minus. Let me write it directly with the for d equals six, where this coefficient here is two to the integer part of uh, six over two, which is two to the three, which is eight. You see, these are the coefficients, what I used to call the C, and these are the objects in the basis. And this is the fifth identity. So all these computa computations of this sort that we did earlier with the derivative of a uh, bilinear are good, but as, uh, you can do them a lot more systematically if you use this uh, formalism with the bispinos. As you see now, There's a similar Leibniz identity where you take directly this guy. So this is a spinorial problem derivative. So this again looks like a Leibniz. Now I replace the substitute the result of um, in the equation for dm eta. This reconstructs a commutator. And now, <clears throat> well, this is one over eight HMP commutator gamma P with the original object.
And this gamma and p, so remember gamma n is a uh, combination of a wedge. It's a left action is a combination of a wedge plus a contraction. And it's a right action, uh, the same with, with the minus. If you uh, use those uh, equations, it turns out that this, uh, the commutator with the gamma and p can be written as, no, perhaps I can write it here, the commutator to gamma and p with a bispino, let's call it C slash, is the slash, for, for this time I, I want to emphasize the slash. So the, the action of this commutator to gamma MP is the same uh, when translated in terms of a form uh, as a wedge and a contraction. This is what I was saying before, but uh, now we can write it a little more clearly. So there's a four here. How do we use this? Well, it would be good to know what these are in terms of our J and Omega. But we do know because look at the right hand side. Here on the right hand side, so if I take the plus sign here, the only guys that survive are the ones with k equals zero, two, four, and six by chirality. So first we have the identity, then we have The bilinear with the with uh, eta plus gamma m n say gamma n m uh, eta plus and that's nothing but our old friend J Then the next guy will contain four gammas, but I promise that that, uh, that object, the, the bilinear with two etas. Now that I don't want to give the argument, it's a bit lengthy, but it, um, it's in fact the Hodge dual of J. This is just because, uh, uh, similar to what I said before in four dimensions, if you have, uh, Gamma one, two, three, four, for example, it can be written as gamma times gamma five, six. But the Hodge dual of J is the same as J squared. So this uh, becomes, in fact, And then the next guy can also be written in terms of uh, uh, J cubed. So long story short, as a form, this whole guy can be written, reconstructs an exp uh, the exponential that we saw. In the Calabria case, 
this e to the minus ij has slashed because instead of having the dx, we have the gammas. Okay, now this in this case, this uh, uh, this uh, twenty minutes of discussion was a uh, complete overkill because if I now this will tell me that dm e to the minus ij is this guy. So perito. Applied to it to the message again. But the two form part of this will uh, just reproduce what we already knew. Now, there is also an analog of this computation um, for when I select minus here. Here it's simpler because. On the only ones that survive in this uh, right hand side have either one, three, or five indices. Now, I told you many times that eta minus, uh, the eta minus dagger gamma m eta plus will be allowed by chirality, but it vanishes by the properties of gamma matrices in six dimensions. The same holds for the gammas, uh, so the bilinear with five gammas. So the only one that remains is the one with three gammas. So in fact, eta plus, eta minus dagger uh, only contains one term. And that term is omega slash. And so applying this formula just gives us the same as this. But we don't make it. Okay, this is lengthy and perhaps boring, but I wanted to show you at least once the underbelly of this type of computation. So how these things are typically done. Now we can try to uh, start reaping the rewards of this analysis and, and see what, uh, what happens. I anticipate that in this case, the rewards will not be that rich. Um, but uh, part of the set of lectures will be to learn techniques rather than just find vector, individual uh, vector. This was a historically important class, but that, and it's uh, elegant uh, mathematically, but that in the end, uh, perhaps not that great for our particular, um, for, for real world physics, let's say. So, Let's see what we can do. So the, for the Calabial case, we didn't use the covariant. We didn't, uh, we were not, um, by the way, sorry, when I go as uh, a technical point, when I go from the, so in this case, I had uh, a bispino identity. This was a bispino equation. When I translate it into equations on forms, I should now use the Nabla symbol. Nabla of a, a form slash is the spinorial covariant derivative of the by spino, uh, the C slash, the by spino corresponding to the form. Form C slash by spino. Remember that the slash is the key for map. 
Okay, so for Calabia, we didn't, um, so we said that for Keller manifold, the possible definition is to consider nabla j uh, and nabla i equal to zero. So j, j and i are commonly constant, or nabla i and nabla g, the matrix, for example, the equivalent to that was for Keller. But for Calabia, we observed at some point that it's uh, there is an alternative reformation, which is nicer, which is the dj and the omega equals zero. So you use the um, the fact that uh, the information on d eta is in one to one correspondence with the information of dj and the omega. This is non trivial, and I told you it's a consequence of the story of intrinsic torsion. There, there is a computation there that I can show this, and that it's done by introducing certain coefficients uh, for the action of dm eta in terms of a basis um, associated to it itself. So then, why do we uh, waste our time with uh, uh, considering nablas? Why don't I? directly consider the wedge. Now, given our early results, there are two ways of doing this. One way is to take an explicit, a more explicit formalism by now, long time ago, here I had this computation for the for the covariant area to J, and I can just anti symmetrize all indices. And the result. Remember this comes about in this. The result is the dj, the exterior differential. Uh, I can write it um, as something like this. But this i dot is just this contraction and what You see, I just is a trick because this uh, particular combination, contraction wedge, um, appears many times. So the other way is to just take these equations, uh, for example, this one, and multiply it by an extra dxm wedge. And then this will become uh, dj on the left hand side. And uh, this thing will uh, become this. I didn't comment about the zero form part of this, so that I took here the two form part of this, but they, uh, there is also interesting in the zero form part, which uh, implies that the this uh, norm of eta is in fact constant. Now, um, I could go on and compute all the rest, but I, uh, it would take us um, some more time. So in the interest of, uh, so this class is fun, but I, I don't want to do really all the computations to the beta. The, 
we have we still have the third equation that we can use in our spinorial set of equations and this can be used to simplify the equations further When I understand the non, these two equations, are equivalent to a following system. So far, the phi didn't even appear here. Because I didn't uh, I didn't even write uh, the second equation. So it would be possible to write that also an equation for omega here, but they, so if you consider also this other equation, you can simplify them both um, quite a bit. And here's the resulting system. This is the perhaps the, um, the there are many ways of uh, formulating the system. This is the one I probably like the most. It's not the uh, first uh, type of reformulation. Let's call it the false Tominger system, even if it's a reformula reformulation by Gonfet. Martelli and Walton. So these are equivalent to these, the same way as this is the analog of the statement that the dm at plus equals zero is equivalent to dj in omega and the omega equal to zero. You notice that now I have to um, write an equation dj square as well. This, well, obviously, in this case, if dj equals zero, dj square is zero as well. So I didn't have to write it uh, separately. There are many reformulations of um, some of these equations, so they, or even of the whole system. So the, for example, you can replace um, Oh, 
right? You can replace the first, for example, with the equation that is perhaps slightly more popular. Is this this guy DC? I introduced it at some point, and this uh, this other this um, real combination of uh, of the Dolbo and its uh, conjugate, the Dolbo operator and its conjugate. Why can I use the Dolbo, by the way? So the, I said that the Dolbo uh, is defined for any almost complete structure, but the, the second equation here implies that the M6 is complex. But since dj is non-zero, this is in general not failure. So why, the, why, sorry, why does this imply that M6 is complex? Well, this is the, we can rewrite it as D omega equal to D5 wedge omega. And then we see that this uh, form W that I introduced long ago is just uh, uh, two D5. So uh, we immediately get that M6 is complex. This, this is why I, I to say that it's uh, more convenient to use this uh, formulation with omega because when we in supersymmetry we always derive some equation on omega and then we see immediately whether the manifold is complex or not that's why you're seeing whether uh, the omega is closed or near closed uh okay this one is beloved by many people i also like it a lot but uh, so <laughs> when you write it as a system it's nicer to write it like this because it always have the same operator on the left hand side. So perhaps a curiosity. Also the, the, the original host Strominger system, another remark is that the original host Strominger system uh, is not written like this because they didn't have the dilaton. They derived it from the whole sheet. They um, took the, the the string propagating on Minkowski times uh, M6, and then they imposed, so with, uh, with some uh, non-zero B field, and then they imposed that the uh, world sheet sigma model is uh, 2 comma 2, has 2 comma 2 uh, world sheet supersymmetry. It turns out that that's equivalent to uh, n equal to supersymmetry in, uh, for the for supergravity, but only if you also impose that the model is conformal invariant. So the, uh, when you just look at the supersymmetry, this 2 comma 2 supersymmetry, uh, the dilaton plays almost by itself. So the, when you supersymmetrize the model, you supersymmetrize the terms including involving G and B. And so you get a subset of the system which doesn't involve the dilaton. What is that subset? Well, it's just this equation that I wrote here by itself and the fact that the manifold is complex. So you can you could uh, say uh, that for host Arminger, the uh, host Arminger only had this and the statement that the uh, ho is tensor is zero. Now, I introduced 
it was good to introduce this um, this class, but I because that it was a warm up. But I need to disappoint you also. It's a warm up, and also for mathematicians, it's a very nice system to study because it's a slight departure from the um, from the Calabria case. The manifold is no longer Calabria because it's not Kähler, but it's uh, still complex, so you can use uh, te uh, technology from uh, the study of complex structures. Then you, it involves this uh, nice operator. And something I didn't say is that uh, we studied it here in type two, but it becomes even nicer and heterotic. In uh, type two, we have dh equals zero, that is the Bianchi identity, but in uh, uh, heterotic uh, dh is no longer zero. Uh, rather, it involves the, the the gauge field and also the curvature. So it, uh, it's schematically of the form trace f square uh, minus r square. So then this becomes a very inviting system to study. Mathem some mathematicians have found some solutions. However, uh, so even in heterotic, there is a problem. So the, this the violation of the H equals zero that I just mentioned uh, is supposed to be an, uh, a, a stringy correction to the leading supergravity approximation. And in order to find solutions, you always, uh, so when you solve a system which involves the supergravity and the leading corrections, Secretly, you are, since you're balancing uh, the leading, uh, leading term with the correction, it, you always expect that the manifold will be small. That the uh, curvature will not be, um, will not be the, the Riemann tensor will not be arbitrarily small. Otherwise, you couldn't possibly have found the non trivial solution. So, already from the fact that you have dh equal r squared, you see that r cannot be negligible. When you, uh, it's like with the fact that when you minimize a polynomial, uh, all the all the monomials will have the more or less the same order of magnitude. So, um, okay, for the heterotic case, it's uh, more interesting, let's say, but uh, also debatable. But in type two, uh, we have a problem. So let me write this. This is, I don't know if you remember, but this is uh, proportional to the HMP and HMP. So it's uh, positive, no, it's not negative. It's only zero when H is zero. But look at this equation. E to the minus two phi star H is minus D E to the minus two phi. Now we integrate by parts. In type two, the H is zero. Thank you. So this thing is zero. But then the integral, if the integral of this is zero, and this is always non-negative, then h is zero. But if h is zero, 
Well, it's not hard to see that they collapse back to the Calabria case. Why? Well, we can see it most easily from the from this equation. We see that now this becomes just a covariant constant C of eta. So in particular, I have a Calabria. That's quite disappointing. Why did this happen? This is part. Okay, so there are uh, no, so, no non trivial solutions in this sense. We introduced age to spice things up from, uh, with respect to the Calabria case, and we go back to the Calabria case. No go theorem. Here I used supersymmetry to uh, to get to this result, but in fact um, you don't even need it. This was noticed uh, by Gibbons uh, long ago in the eighties. Perhaps it went unnoticed for a long time. We we'll discovered a couple of times. And strengthened in particular by Mandelson and Nunes. The original argument um, is very general. It only requires the so-called strong energy condition. The energy conditions are conditions on the, on the uh, stress and energy tensor or gravitational theory. They come in many shapes. There, there's a whole web of uh, assumptions that, uh, that people make. And in particular, this one, says that um, it's that this Tmn minus one over T minus two for a d-dimensional theory. This whole thing times nm nm, where nm is time like this. A strong energy condition.
the trick is that the so okay well, what can you do given this uh, strong energy condition well the einstein equation of any such theory sorry the einstein equation will always be uh, something like this exactly with this with this thing on the right hand side This sort of says that uh, gravity is attractive, this strong energy condition. Now let's take a um, capital D to be four plus small d. And let me even allow for this um, famous warping. Function. And now I can compute the the rich tensor. Of this guy, for this particular uh, metric, and specialize it to uh, the, to the take the indices to be along the space time. You don't quite get the uh, just the Ricci tensor of of, uh, of the maximum symmetric space here. MS4, but you also get the contribution from this A. And now what's the problem? If you take the time component of this, this is on one on the one hand, uh, this energy for no not. Is this uh, guy again? On the other hand, say pi gn, t no not minus uh, this now one uh, small t plus two gmn. TPP. By the strong energy condition, this is uh, a negative. And so it is also if we multiply the whole thing by to the two A. So now we multiply by two A and we integrate. And we get what? We get this integral. But 
but this is supposed to be a total derivative, so it would be zero. And then plus this thing, which is no negative. Uh, sorry, however, there was uh, this G4 for uh, zero here. So if I put it on the, this is negative, of course, I put it on the other side. So it changes the sign. And so what, do they, what did I find? Lambda is not, uh, not negative. Not positive. So this argument alone only shows that there is no decitter. But even for lambda equals zero, you are tightly constrained because then the this thing should be zero, and then if you go see what uh, what it is for string theory, it implies. no fluxes. So only Ricci flux. We get back to the Calabiao case. In particular, the nosity in here is terrible. How do we avoid this? Well, in string theory, not everything uh, really solves uh, really satisfies the strong energy condition. One is the so-called uh, so the uh, non-dynamical parameter F not, which is the Roman, uh, which is the Ramon Ramon flux with no indices, with zero indices. This is allowed, and it's called the Roman's mass. However, before you get too excited, this um, loophole was closed. by Maldesen and Nunez. That's why I said that they stranded uh, the theorem. And the other thing is the orientable planes. These are uh, objects that contribute to the, um, that um, uh, act as a source to the uh, Ramon Ramon fields. And moreover, I should also mention that uh, they act as a source to the Ramon Ramon fields, and also they uh, they they make this uh, e to the a behave in singular ways. So they, how will they um, be placed in our quantification? Well, they typically we want we don't want to if we want to study vacuum solution. How can we? Uh, Produce these orientable planes. Well, we will make them extended over all directions of space time, so they are everywhere as far as a four dimensional observer is concerned, and then localized somewhere in the internal space. 
Then if you go in the internal space near those places, you'll uh, see that uh, A behaves singularly. And so then it's perhaps not entirely clear that this, um, uh, this step is uh, completely okay. Or in any case, even uh, more strongly, uh, the not only A is divergent, but also the, um, the string corrections that come into play because the curvature becomes curvature and uh, dilaton uh, become typically strong near such orientable planes. So then, um, the when you this theorem only apply to a two derivative um, theory of gravity because it, see it's uh, of this form are a for stress energy tensor. For full string theory, where there are high derivative corrections, uh, this will no longer be true. No one knows, really. So that's another reason the, uh, the theorem is invalidated by orientals. First of all, they, even in supergravity, they act as an extra term here to TMN that doesn't satisfy this hypothesis. And second, they uh, caused uh, large corrections to uh, large um, curvature and large uh, string coupling, which make the very hypothesis of the, the first hypothesis of the, of the theorem, of the, um, yeah, of the theorem not hold. So, all planes are the future and in particular we should switch on Raman Raman fields. Will be my quest for the remaining lectures. So I will go back to the supersymmetry equations and uh, show you um, semi explicitly one class. Of course, not today. Today, uh, we'll see what we will do with the remaining 10 minutes. Uh, and we'll see that there's at least one class with that, uh, which uh, makes us go slightly beyond the Calabria assumption, which is called the F theory class. We'll do uh, some computation for those. Then I'll mention uh, another similar class. Uh, where they, the Calabria metric is distorted by um, only by an overall function. And then we'll dedicate the rest of the uh, next lecture to the quest for more general vector to the general problem. But for now, I want to, since we will have to get involved with these all planes, I want to show you uh, what I just what I was just saying and now that they, um, near them the, uh, near these objects there is a there's a large uh, contribution to the, um, the, the large curvature. Well, I was told that you, I shouldn't necessarily assume that everyone knows um, the equations of motion. And the action. So we know by now the fields I write the type two equations and then this, the solutions relevant both to our planes and to the brains. Well, perhaps I have five minutes of so perhaps today only the equations, we'll see.
this dot was uh, defined long ago. It's the contraction of the indices with the one or k factorial. Let me write here on the plus sources. So these are the contribution, the delta like sources. Um, of a brain and a plane. Before you forget, uh, before you complain that I'm not writing this explicitly, remember that even in uh, general relativity, you, I want to ask you if you ever checked that the, um, the delta is correctly reproduced in the Schwarzschild uh, solution. So the, in, in uh, general relativity, there should be a delta in the equation of motion, a delta like term in the origin. And I wonder if you ever checked that that delta is correctly reproduced. My guess is no, because this is a topic of current research, in fact. And here, Fm is likewise the contraction of iota with F, and F is the formal sum of all the Ramon Ramon fluxes, Ramon Ramon uh, P strands. But so in two way, we go all the way to F10. So instead of having only the F2, F4, first of all, we also have F0, non dynamical as it may be, where we include it, in the, we can include it in the equation of motion. And then we also include F6, F10, F8. They're defined just as the duals with some signs. of the ordinary ones. The same thing for two A. Is this definition? So you collect all the Fs in the single entity, the single polyform. One says. So we already saw a polyform. This that formal exponential of J is a polyform. A collection of a formal sum of forms of different degrees. And once you do that, then you have that the Einstein equation become very nice. And then let's see. Let me give it a dilaton. A 
But to be sure, these delta like sources can be written explicitly, but I will need to introduce quite a bit of notation. Maybe I can write this up to sources. Uh, this is a Bianchi, but let me write it anyway. And then with this uh, definition, the Bianchi of F is quite nice. This is in fact, both the Bianchi, it collects both the Bianchi and the equation of motion, because you see that some, you have DF1 equals zero, say into B, DF, uh, which is a Bianchi, DF3 equal HF1 is a Bianchi, but then going up, you see that you'll find DF9 equal H. So if you take, I don't know, the 10 form part of this equation, you have DF9 equal H wedge F7. And uh, that is D of star F1 equal minus H wedge star F3, which is an equation of motion. And finally, you have all right. Mm, this is incorrect. like this there's a fancier way but let me okay the equation motion for the B field. Didaton. And this is a mix of Einstein and Didaton. All right, so next time, orientifolds and general vector.